All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. We'll know that people are going to trickle in. Hi, everyone. I'm Don Saucy. I'm the Faculty Associate Director of the Teaching and Learning Center. I am so excited that you're here for our professional development series. Um, we're going to begin today with a land acknowledgement. All right, I'll go ahead and share my screen and sound. And then, Don, can you see what I want you to see? Perfect. Okay, here we go. As the first land-grant institution established under the 1862 Morrill Act, we acknowledge that the state of Kansas is, historically, home to many Native nations, including the Kaw, Osage, and Pawnee, among others. Furthermore, Kansas is the current home to four federally recognized Native nations, the Prairie Band Potawatomi, the Kickapoo Tribe of Kansas, the Iowa Tribe of Kansas and Nebraska, and the Sac and Fox Nation of Missouri in Kansas and Nebraska. Many Native nations utilized the Western Plains of Kansas as their hunting grounds, and others, such as the Delaware, were moved through this region during Indian removal efforts to make way for white settlers. It's important to acknowledge this, since the land that serves as the foundation of this institution was, and still is, stolen land. We remember these truths because K-State's status as a land-grant institution is a story that exists within ongoing settler colonialism, and rests on the dispossession of indigenous peoples and nations from their lands. These truths are often invisible to many. The recognition that K-State's history begins and continues through indigenous contexts is essential. Please remember these truths because we still remember. Thank you. Um, and I would like to thank all of you for joining us today for our TLC Professional Development Seminar. Our seminar, our, our PD series meets every Wednesday at noon in real time over Zoom. Uh, same Zoom link will get you here every, every day for the, the rest of the semester. Um, we also have our videos archived on our TLC webpage for asynchronous viewing for anyone that is interested in this information or needs this information but wasn't able to attend here in real time. We also, if you attend enough of our events, do some post-event surveys, maybe in a reflection, you can earn a professional development certificate. And my colleagues have just dropped that information in the chat. It's also available on the TLC webpage at all times. Um, and you can earn a professional development certificate either as a GTA or a faculty staff member. And faculty staff members, we also have the opportunity to potentially become a TLC fellow, um, which means that you actually might get invited to present our PD series next year, which is kind of a cool thing. So we're very excited about those opportunities. I also want to let you know that our formal call for the SOTL Showcase is going to come out soon. SOTL Showcase is the showcase on the scholarship on teaching and learning, which is what SOTL stands for. It'll be the Monday of finals week, I believe, in Hale Library starting at 1 p.m. We'll have a slate of oral presentations as well as poster presentations where people can share their, their SOTL research, innovative teaching practices, and those kind of things. Um, and we'll have the call uh, for people to submit proposals to that coming out here shortly. We'll put that call out over all of our TLC kind of communication things over Facebook, over uh, X, formerly known as Twitter. Um, we'll put it in our, in our newsletter. It'll be available on our webpage. Um, so you'll be able to do that. We look forward to people sharing their stuff. Next week, we'll be having a TLC chat. For those of you who have never been part of a TLC chat before, kind of like TLC office hours. Uh, so what will happen is I'll bring in a couple questions that I kind of want to talk about in crowdsource. We're also open to you discussing any questions or concerns that you have. It's a great way to kind of meet some colleagues uh, and have an opportunity to share some ideas. But before next week, we have an amazing event this week. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Ulmer is joining us from um, our Department of Agricultural Econ uh, Economics, um, and we'll be talking about engaging students in the material for appropriate depth of learning. I'm so excited to have Dr. Ulmer here. Jonathan, the floor is yours. Thanks, Don. Um, I would say that a department is actually communications and agricultural education, uh, but uh, I'm a professor of agricultural education within the department, and my primary job is to help prepare students to be future high school agriculture teachers. So I get to teach about teaching, uh, which is uh, a lot of fun, but also uh, at times kind of challenging. Uh, as, as Don and I were talking about earlier, uh, sometimes when you're teaching about teaching, you have an extra pressure of trying to model what you're doing. Uh, and I will tell you that today's topic, uh, really engagement in the material, uh, has been a piece that uh, some colleagues and I have, have talked through uh, and I'll, today I'll introduce kind of this uh, continuum of engagement that uh, was mentioned in my um, 
in my uh, in my little uh, intro piece, but it, it really is a, a conceptual framework, a conceptual model that a good friend of mine uh, at Texas Tech and I talked through. I was at Texas Tech before. I was at K State and. We've actually used his name in that continuum. We call it, we he and I refer to it as the Burris's continuum of engagement. And so I'll show you that in a little while. Uh, I guess I guess he's now a department chair. We use his name instead of mine. So uh, we'll we'll do that. So when we think about engagement uh, in our classes, we often think about how we interact with our students or how our students are interacting with us. Are they paying attention? Are they part of the educational process? But I want us today to think about engagement in a little bit different way. Uh, if we look up engagement uh, in educational research in the, the um, uh, literature that is out there, we'll see that they're actually defined as two types of engagement in the educational process. The first one is active engagement. That's where the students are uh, can be physically doing something in the uh, in the process of learning, whether that's actually uh, doing the skill they're being taught, whether that's up and moving in the activity, uh, those are actively engaged. But we can't also forget that we can be actively engaged and still in our seat if they're doing a, uh, a worksheet or uh, an activity at their seat. They, they can be actively engaged. The other side of engagement is passive engagement. Passive engagement is really when we think about, are we having them use their mind? Can we get them to use their mind while they're in the learning process? Are they, are they actually listening? Are they taking notes? Are they thinking? And quite honestly, uh, to really understand passive engagement is more difficult because it's often an internal process. It's also very hard to score if you're doing observational research on students. It's easy to see if they're doing some sort of active engagement. It's difficult to see them do some sort of passive engagement. I also maintain that because our brains are a little bit like a black box, I don't really know if there's something happening inside between those two ears. Uh, and so my job is to not make my students think, it's to try to get them to think or put them in situations where they should be able to think in, a, in the context. So active and passive, Engage, engagement are two ways to think about engagement in our teaching or in our material. That being obviously in addition to, are they engaging with us or with each other? Uh, so keep those two distinctions in mind as we go forward. So all of us, uh, as we teach, teach in different styles and methods. We use different methods. We have our own uh, desires on how we like to learn, which often is comes out in how we teach. Uh, and we also look at our material and we try to make those fit, uh, those styles and methods fit to what we're teaching. So we, got, we, we should be teaching, thinking about the end in mind. So what do we want our students to do when they're completely done? Now, those that might be your objective for the lesson. So what do I need to do in my teaching to get them to that objective. As we think about that pro process, I can actually have my students very involved in what I want them to teach or very little involved in what I want them to teach. So if we think about a spectrum, I can have low engagement in my material. For instance, I just finished a class uh, 40 minutes ago with some students who we were talking about running their high school FFA chapter. And I gave them a presentation on, here are some of the, uh, the recognitions a student can earn. Very uh, low engagement if I just present the material. If I start to ask them some questions, try to get them to connect to what I'm doing, I may move a little further away from low engagement. On the other hand, I may teach a lesson where I'm at the other end of the spectrum and what they are doing is the actual skill that I want them to learn in the actual uh, environment that they're going to need to use it. So as I teach uh, people how to be high school teachers, 
we think about the student teaching experience, that is fully engaged in the skills that I want them to learn. They're in a classroom, they're teaching to real students, they had to plan it, they had to come up with the material, they are fully engaged in that material. What I'd like you to do is to take a minute and just jot down or take note of what is something that you taught that has been low engagement, where you were the center of instruction, where your students were maybe passively engaged, we hope they were thinking about what you were teaching, but they were not fully involved in the content. Also jot down, what's something you have taught where they were completely involved in the content or the skill that we wanted them to learn? So just jot that down for a moment, the, those, two, those two areas. All right, so we have less than 20 folks on here. So I'm actually gonna take the opportunity to, to get a little bit of information from you. So we're gonna start with something we've shared, uh, that something we've taught that's low, low engagement, and I'll offer another one. When I teach about the history of the land grant system to my future career and technical education teachers, I often go through the timelines of the Morrill Act and what case, how K-State connected to those. So that's very, very teacher-centered, uh, very low engagement in that historical timeline. All right, anybody else willing to share something they've taught with low engagement, low engagement in the material? So I raised my hand, but I'll just I'll just talk. All right, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. So in my in my general psychology class, it's a it's a one hundred level class. It's foundational. Hundreds of students in there. Uh, a lot of the times when I'm putting out theories for the first time, um, we'll give them the theory. We'll give them the components of the theory. Yesterday I was talking about six of the of the behaviors uh, that are expressions of intelligence. So it's. It's something where I really I have that organization, I put it out there for them. I do try to involve them with questions and reflection on that, but it, it is more of that traditional sense where I'm giving that information out. All right. Great example. Mary Ellen, I saw that you unmuted. Did you have you wanted, one you wanted to share? Oh, I was thinking about um, when I'm presenting to students, especially um, early on in the fall semester, often it's a... Um, kind of a, a brief overview of the services that we have at the Career Center, um, maybe a brief overview of like our handshake system and the events that are coming up before I try to then go into some more interactive pieces. But that first part's pretty low engagement. Great. And I both of the examples we were given uh, were foundational knowledge, foundational information. And I agree, those are often uh, low engaged. So we have some uh, we have some examples in our chat. Uh, resume writing. We're going to talk through what are the parts of the resume when we really are helping them understand what those resumes are. Absolutely, probably low engagement. Basic plant processes. We're going to go through and tell them those processes. It's really hard for them to do uh, to understand photosynthesis and be involved in that part of the lesson. Absolutely. Formulated sentences and tenses, aspects of, aspects of the English language, absolutely. We have to give them this foundational information. And we have to really uh, convey that to them. Low engaged in the material. Uh, and bone marrow physiology, uh, Dr. Pullman, boy, I tell you, you're outside of my expertise, but I can understand when we're talking about the physiology, we have to actually have some uh, teaching that is teacher-centered to give to understand that physiology before we go on to other pieces. So great, I appreciate you sharing those. Now I'll flip it the other way. So we also can have that high engaged lesson. And so I actually get to teach some classes that are uh, agricultural mechanics based uh, as, as I would prepare them to teach those topics later on. So my example uh, for my high engaged is when I'm teaching them about uh, small engines, I actually have them taking apart an engine, putting it back together, and it's supposed to run when they when they finish. I say supposed to because sometimes it doesn't. That's highly engaged. They are learning the parts. 
the pieces, how they go together, and they're getting their hands dirty. That's highly engaged in that material. Now, I had a low engage before then because we talked about those parts and pieces and we talked about how they work together. But then I did the highly engage the material at the end. So who would like to share who is willing to share something they do that is highly engaged with the material? Carrie's got role playing the interpretation of results from a career interest inventory. That's great. That's awesome. Don? So uh, one, of the, one of the things that I do in my principal college teaching class, and this will happen next week, is they actually have to resolve dilemmas in small groups. So we'll give them a teaching dilemma, and they've got to kind of figure out how to do that. We don't we don't create product and things like that, but you might, but we kind of find ways to get them actively involved there too. Absolutely. And we're actually going to talk about, Don, your example actually gives us uh, an example of uh, maybe not all the way to the end of the spectrum, but we're sure shift in that direction. And we're going to talk more about that as well. All right, we have hydroponics. I assume, uh, Cynthia, that we've got uh, um, a hydroponic system that we're working with. They're using it. They're they're getting, in this case, getting their hands wet and doing that work. Um, practice pervasive. Oh, it popped off the top here. You guys are doing great. Uh, practicing right storytelling. Absolutely, we give them. They have them do it. We give them feedback. We could probably have them do it again, or they get feedback from their partners or their small groups. Fantastic actually creating blood smear preparation that's realistic that's fully engaged in the system uh student teaching work teaching students workers how to do basic uh herbarium creation tasks you bet they're creating the product they're all the way to that actually doing it uh jury selection activity they role play as uh, for, uh prosecutors versus defense attorneys to pick 12 jurors from larger pool that's fantastic. I love that. I'm pretty sure I've never had an example like that come up in one of my classes. Uh, that is great. That is realistic. Um, uh, and uh, eventually they will do that in the actual um, uh, in the actual atmosphere also. So this gets us really close to the very end of the spectrum. Um, the leadership speakers um, built a model represent engagement. Good. Uh, turn a classroom into camera into camera obscura and other class and groups that looked at different measures of happiness. These are all great experience, great examples, getting us towards the other end to that fully engaged. So why would we teach at one, one end of the spectrum or the other? Well, I mentioned that if we are teaching some foundational information, they have to have some basic knowledge to build from. That's often what we're teaching at the low engagement level of our uh, of our spectrum, that we are teaching to give them the knowledge that they can then use to build from. And we're going to talk about knowledge in just a moment, just as a foundation to, to not forget about it. But we have to build some sort of foundation into it for them to build from and to use. We're hoping they're using that basic knowledge in our low engaged uh, lessons. Why would we teach at the high end of the spectrum? Well, if you're if you understand the behavioral learning theory at all, a behave somebody who truly believes holistically in the behavioral learning theory would say until we see them do a behavior, we don't know they can actually do it. Now we can argue whether that's the 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 best way to think about things, but for us to truly know our students uh, can do something, can do a task, to have a skill. The best way for us to assure that would be to have them do it. Realistic? Not always, but sometimes it is realistic. So uh, I'm going to do things just a little bit different here. I'm actually going to um, uh, I'm actually going to shift my camera down to my desk and I'm going to actually uh, use uh, uh, some paper and I'm going to draw some things or show you some things. So I'm going to kind of go back and forth. But as we think about knowledge, one of the most foundational theories on knowledge is is Bloom's taxonomy. And we think about Bloom's taxonomy with the, with the cognitive uh, aspect, uh, cognition being the thought process. Uh, and Bloom's and his team uh, really said that uh, knowledge, uh, uh, knowing something, learning something can happen in steps. Uh, and uh, Bloom's taxonomy was built in six steps. Now in 2001, there was a revision of Bloom's taxonomy one of the original authors was part of this author team that that uh, uh, that uh, rewrote it. 
uh, and they made it a little bit more uh, active thinking. Now, I have colleagues who are very true to uh, the original blooms and those who are very uh, uh, into the new blooms. And so your preference, uh, I get we're going to we're going to go with uh, we're going to give you new blooms at this point. So I'm going to adjust my camera. All right. So uh, I'm going to write them one way and then I think I'll flip them. I think I flip them upside down so you can see them. But I'll see here that I'm going to write the first level of blooms as apply. And uh, the second, actually, that's, um, actually, I'm, that's, I apologize, I'm getting ahead of myself. The first level is remember. Uh, the next level is understand. Then we go to apply, then to analyze. Then to evaluate. And finally, we have create. Now, does that make it right side up for you, Noah? All right. I thought I, thought I had that correct. So you'll notice when I wrote them, I wrote them from the bottom of the list to the top of the list. In Bloom's Taxonomy, there are really two rules. Rules are uh, that they build on themselves. So I've written them as building blocks. So I must be able to remember something to understand it. And I must be able to understand it to apply it and so on. Now there's some debate on how these top four really connect in that way, but, but holistically uh, they build on each other. The other rule is that they get harder as we move from remember towards create. So if I have them remembering things, that is not as hard cognitively as if I have them creating something with their knowledge. So build on themselves and they, uh, um, and they get harder as they go. So that's Bloom's taxonomy. What does that have to do with, uh, with engagement? Well, usually when we're teaching with low engaged uh, instruction, we're having our students remember or understand. This is what we would call lower, lower order thinking skills. As we move towards more engagement in the material, we're getting more towards these top levels, which are called higher order thinking skills. And for many of you, I'm sure this is you've seen this before. So this is just a reminder. Uh, so we have Bloom's taxonomy. We have how do we get our students to move from just remembering things to be able to apply it? or to look at a current situation and evaluate with it. And usually when we get into the higher order thinking skills, we have to make sure that our students are more involved in the instruction. So I've mentioned this continuum a few times, so let's introduce it. Here is Burris's continuum of engagement. And I'm gonna tell you right now, this is not a flashy theory. So at one end of our uh, spectrum, we have low engagement, which might be talking or listening about material. So we have this low engagement, either they're having a little conversation or they're listening to us as we teach about it. On the other end of our spectrum, we have high engagement. Now this one's a little harder to define, but I'm going to call it doing the activity in the actual situation. All right. Talking or listening, doing the activity in the actual situation. So what do I mean by in the actual situation? I would say that in our instruction of our future teachers, they do not actually get to the very highest on the continuum until they have their own classroom and they are the person in charge, which actually is probably when they have a job. So I get them as far over to there as I can, which means that I get them uh, to student teaching or the student teaching internship. They still have uh, protection. They still have guidance. They still have mentorship, but they're doing the activity, just not in their own uh, 
I guess, uh, have all of the responsibility situations. So um, you can kind of see how hard it is for us sometimes to get all the way to this end of the spectrum. So we must think about where do, where do we want to teach them for the material that we are teaching and where can we teach them for what we're trying to uh, teach them? So I'm gonna jump back up here for just a minute. So I think there are two questions we must ask ourselves in this context when it comes to having our students engage in the material. What is, uh, what is the optimal spot on the spectrum for us to teach? And what is the realistic location for us to teach? So let me give you an example. When I teach in my ag mechanics laboratories, classrooms, I often will teach, I, I always teach about safety related to our uh, subject. So safety, uh, when we talk about uh, in, our, in a welding course, safety relates to protecting your eyes from both debris and from light protecting your hands from sparks and from heat. When I teach them about safety, I am not going, the, the absolute best way to learn that you cannot handle something with your bare hands is to handle something with your bare hands. That is not optimal. So I don't teach them all the way to that full understanding. I teach them uh, a basic and then how do they prevent the accidents? I like to tell my students, that they have to fully understand safety because I want to want them to fully have all of their fingers. To understand how somebody can lose a finger is for them to have somebody lose a finger. Not optimal. Not going to go there. That is not realistic, nor is it optimal. So I make a choice about where I'm going to teach that material. Um, sometimes we stop along the way of this continuum multiple times as we teach a subject. So if we wanna talk about, uh, I, I think the jury selection activity is the one I'm gonna choose here. You think about jury selection, we're gonna teach about how we decide what we're looking for in jury members. And I'm gonna I'm spitballing here because you're outside of my, my expertise, but uh, I think I can see uh, kind of where we're headed. So I'm going to teach about what we might look be looking for. Then I might teach about uh, how we're going to ask questions. And maybe I have them practice asking questions of potential jurors. And then eventually I get to making some sort of mock uh, jury selection process. And you can see we're moving along the continuum from low engagement in the material to high engagement in the material. So I'm going to give you uh, an example that I actually use quite a bit in my welding course. And, and honestly, it's easy to show examples in these hands-on classes that I get to teach. It's not always so easy in some of our theoretical classes, and I teach some of those as well. Uh, so let me give you this example because I love this example. So when I teach students about the different, let's see, maybe it'll focus. My camera will get it figured out. When I teach students about the different uh, joints that metal can be joined, I will start with talking about what are the different joints. So I have uh, a joint that's called a butt weld. And I have one that's called a T weld. And I have uh, one that's called um, a, I just lost it, I apologize. Um, we have one that's called a lap weld. And so I'm going to tell them each of these. Then I would probably draw it. So a butt weld is taking two pieces of metal, butting them together, and the students would then weld those two pieces of metal together. I would then also draw the lap weld, where I have a piece of metal that I lay down, and I have another piece of metal that I lay on top of it, and I weld in this joint. Great. They get to see it on a board in two dimensional. They've only heard me talk about it. They've heard me define it. I'm at the low end of the spectrum for engagement. 
how do I make sure I can move them to the higher end, but still be safe? Well, something fun I like to do is I bring out the love crackers and I bring out the spray cheese and I say, make a butt weld and my crackers aren't cooperating. Simulated welding. By the way, it's also great with graham crackers and if you can find a uh, spray uh, uh, frosting. I would then do a lap weld. By the way, by the definition of welding, joint, welding is joining two pieces of material together. I have just welded crackers. So it's what we call a simulation. A mock jury trial is a simulation. It's not actually selecting for the jury, it's a simulation. I have my students go through mock interviews. We talk about interview skills, they go through mock interviews. We're preparing them and I'm getting them as far as I can before they go to the real thing. Now I'm gonna tell you in my welding course, after they get to do welding with crackers, they go to a lab and they weld, which shifts them further down the spectrum of being engaged in their, uh, in their material. So I want you to take a moment and I want you to think about one of the topics you're teaching. Is your level engagement as far on the spectrum as it should be? Or if you have something that's down the spectrum, should you be stopping somewhere in the spectrum before you get to the end? Should you do a simulation before you actually put a welder in their hand? If you're teaching something at the low level, is there another step that could be higher that you could then extend their learning, their, create a, a more depth in their learning uh, by moving yourself down the spectrum? Does anybody have an example they would like to share of something they might uh, adjust to move further down the spectrum? Sometimes these are hard to see until we're in the midst of our planning of our lesson and we think, you know what? I, I should probably get a little more depth of this knowledge. How can I get my students to, to do it more, to, to, do, to, to be more involved in it? So Don's, so Don's a trooper for me. Come on, Don. <laughs> so, so Jonathan, one of the things that occurred, so my principal of the college teaching class, we're trying to have them teach college classes. Right. And I was thinking, you know, we, we have them do demos, you know, kind of in my class. And then for the psych students, we have a follow-up class where they teach their own class. I could see us trying to do a little bit more formal things for all the students, even the ones who don't, you know, take the, the subsequent class in psych sciences um, to try to get them further along because- you know, it's, it's, but the, the thing that I struggle with, and, and it's kind of like you mentioned the, you know, the, the, the only way to really realize sometimes what we're doing is to incur great risk. You know, we, we yeah, risk right. putting someone in front of a classroom that is not going to be good for them or for their students. So it's, yeah. so I, that is that risk component. I think that I sometimes have struggle with it getting to the more extreme. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, and, and when we're talking about the teaching process, we're not just talking about the risk of the teacher. We're talking about, um, are we, are we uh, undermining the education of other people? I completely get that. And, and we actually have had lots of discussions about that in our teacher preparation program. Uh, and let me give you an example of, of kind of how we've changed our point on the continuum. So in previous institutions I've been to, as our students are learning to teach, they've taught to each other. Uh, and if you have ever uh, thought about a false teaching environment, it's teaching, mock teaching to your peers uh, who don't act like the students you're going to teach. They know where your buttons are and how to push you or that they don't want to listen to your topic or whatever it may be. And actually, at some places, they'll give the students roles like they might say, Don, today 
uh, you're going to be the troublemaker. And uh, no matter what they try, Don just keeps being the troublemaker. It's not realistic. Uh, so that's, 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 we didn't want to put risk on the students. Here at K-State in Ag Education, we actually, uh, our students actually go out four times in the fall and teach in high school classrooms, but it's one 50 minute period. It's one uh, time the teacher can then go back and reteach if they need to the next day. Uh, it's a little different than the high school three times or the college three times a week, those types of things that if we miss a week, we're in trouble. So, so we've tried to move a little bit on the spectrum and still try to protect the learner in that experience. So that's, I completely get that. So Carrie shared, turn a classroom into, uh, let's see. Oh, um, Angela shared, students can bring their toys, dolls, action figures to study, practice anatomical movements and joints. That's awesome. Uh, Dr. Pullman, uh, teach them to biopsy on a piece of fruit before moving to tissue. Then they practice on tissue harvested from an animal. Uh, then they do the real biopsy on a patient. That is moving along the spectrum. And, and in fact, Dr. Pullman, I actually thought when I was preparing this, one of the examples I thought is uh, in some of the animal science courses at the high school level, uh, they learn to give injections. And uh, I'm not ready to let a high school student go on an animal and give them injections. Uh, so we often have them give injections into fruit uh, oranges work great for intramuscular and bananas work great for uh, subcutaneous. Uh, but it was, it was uh, mentioned to me that if we used chicken thighs or chicken wings, they're actually giving shots into muscle and actually, oddly enough, they're cheaper than fruit. So it's actually the same process, the same experience, but because we're actually using tissue that is, that is similar to the animal, we've moved them on the continuum. And then maybe as they, maybe they have their own animal or maybe we have a school farm that they can give injections that way. Uh, so yes, absolutely. Um, so I think it's important for us in, in higher education, we often think of today, I'm going to teach this topic. Wednesday, I'm gonna to teach that topic. Friday, I'm gonna teach the next topic. So we need to think about we teach a topic on Monday. Can I do an activity on Wednesday that moves them on the spectrum to create depth? And I'll be the first to admit that takes time out of potentially teaching something else. So we must balance the depth uh, of learning with the amount of learning. And we have outcomes we have to get through, but these are these are things we need to, to consider. Uh, for many years, there was a perception that college, that instruction at universities was very uh, philosophical and theoretical, and you go there and you get these philosophies and you get these theories. But if we're truly preparing our students for careers, they also need to get the depth uh, to be able to use, and they need to gain some skills and techniques to be able to uh, move down that, to, to move into those careers so we don't have a remedial uh, instruction. Now, here's another piece I want to throw in, and that is that sometimes we have a class that is at many times we have a class that is at the low end of the continuum for engagement. And then they take another class that predominantly shifts and another class that shifts some more and so on. And I'll use our teaching, uh, preparing teachers as an example. They may take a class that talks to them about the, uh, the teaching methods, the philosophies that go into the educational process, uh, the, um, the foundation, foundational theories of what they can teach or how they teach. And then we have another class that teaches them how to implement those as they plan lessons, as they create units, as they create curriculum. And then maybe a separate class or mixed into to the, to the second class, or maybe a third class or mixed into the second class, we have them practice teaching to someone. And then we move on to student teaching. It's still a course in their program, but they're actually doing, they're actually practicing, they're actually messing up, they're actually doing great, whatever it may be. But that continuum happened over two, three, four, five semesters. That doesn't, and I teach one of those foundational philosophical classes. That doesn't mean that all of my material 
should only be taught at the low end of the spectrum. That means holistically that class is at the low end of the spectrum. And I need to, for the sake of my students, figure out a way to shove some of the material closer to the high end. And I offer, one of the principles of teaching and learning, which is another subject I teach, is that students learn what they practice and apply. I struggle with, in my foundational philosophical classes, I'm not really having them practice and apply things. And, and how can I do more of that? And that's hard in a philosophical and theoretical class. I don't have to get them to practice and apply, but can I get them more depth in that knowledge if I get them moving towards the right side of the spectrum? And I might only move that far, but how do I get them to move? So many of our many of our degrees are are progressing towards the to the to the high end of the spectrum by semester, or maybe the semester goes moves itself. We should never be, um, I guess, ashamed or disappointed that we're teaching low end. We should be teaching at low end when low end is appropriate. We should be teaching at high end when high end is appropriate. And again. We must consider not just what is optimal, but what is realistic. My example on what is optimal versus what is realistic is I'm going to adjust my camera here just one more time, and you will see up on top of that shelf a small balsa wood house. So I also get to teach a class on construction. How do you make a wall? How do you make rafters? We're not going to build a house. But if I can help teach them the theories of what goes into a rafter and then they make a small one down the road when they need to make a, a shop or a shed or whatever it may be, they have at least made it in scale level because that was what was realistic for our class. They can, they can use that information to be able to transfer to doing it in the actual location, in the actual process. So. What is, what is the optimal and what is the most realistic? Well, I'd be happy to answer any questions or take any thoughts at this point. I've been going for about 40, 40 or 45 minutes. So um, I will open the floor to anything that you would like to throw out at. Jonathan, I just wanna amplify a point that you made because I made the point in my, in my college teaching class yesterday. And that is, that lecture is not a dirty word. It's, it's, right. it's not something that we should avoid in pedagogy. It's got a really important, efficient way to get out information. And that research actually shows that a rhythm to a class that is lecture, then play, lecture, then play, lecture, then play is actually a really good way to provide Absolutely. them some information that you can then deepen. But I think for the, it, it became cool to say that lecture was an awful way to teach. It's, it's yeah. not, and especially if you're going to do a dynamic and infuse, you know, some active learning in it. But I, I really just wanted to amplify that point because I really agree with what you said there. Well, I would also say that I think lecture has gotten a pretty bad uh, reputation because we've all seen really bad lectures. And um, there, there, are, there are techniques to make sure that our lectures are, um, that the information is conveyed well but also so that it isn't just a person at the front of the room yapping. Um, I'm a teacher who actually tries, I ask a lot of questions to try to move from one point to the other. And, you know, that is one technique to kind of change the lecture up a little bit. So you're exactly right uh, about um, it is, it is a, it is a strong tool that should be used, but uh, there also is skill to using it well. So Ron, I expect Ron to ask hard questions. Ron, put any reflections on how remote teaching might differ from in, in person or not. So Ron, this is what I struggle with uh, because our online teaching should be uh, equal in quality to our in-person teaching. Uh, the, the What a student learns and the depth of what they learn should be the same if they're sitting in uh, Weber Hall, or Eisenhower Hall, wherever, or, or if they're sitting in Garden City. And I truly believe that we need to figure out ways to make them, I shouldn't say make, to get them to do the skills, even if they're somewhere else. Some of our topics actually uh, lend themselves to that easier than others. 
So we are having discussions about how to teach some of our courses uh, remotely. And honestly, what we've had discussions with is, can we go somewhere, a central location for an afternoon to have guided practice, to have to move to that continuum with us local? Uh, there also are classes on this campus, uh, very hands-on material. Uh, there's, a, there's a class in animal science that is anatomy and physiology of animals. And those, those students get a kit of all of the lab supplies. And if you do a lab here on campus, if you're online, you're doing the same lab. You might be doing it in your on your dining room table. You might be doing it on your coffee table. You might be doing it in your shop, but you're still doing it. Just because we have the supplies here doesn't mean you can't have the slide supplies in your uh, own facility or your own home. I would also say that uh, it is harder to um, it's harder to get students to do the activity. So I've often said, you know, I'm going to do a lecture. I'm going to do a, a five minute video. And then at the end of that video, I'm going to give you some instructions. And when you're done with that, come to the next video. So go do this. Go, go reflect, go do, go be active, and then do the next video. What we find is a lot of our students just click the next video. Uh, by the way, our on-campus students would do the exact same thing. It's not that they're not any different learners. They just, that's just our tendency. Let's move through. Let's be honest. I probably would do the same thing also. Uh, so how can we put, how can we teach, give them an activity? Maybe we give them, maybe online there's a handout. Uh, maybe there's a worksheet. Maybe there's instructions that have a specific outcome, and then they come back for the next piece of instruction. Uh, so I, it's difficult to create. It takes a lot more thought to uh, create an activity that you can ensure they're going to do it. Uh, than it is in, cam in on campus when I'm walking around the room making sure you're doing the activity that I've just instructed you to do. But it's equally as important to shift them uh, towards that higher end as far as they need to be on our online instruction as it is uh, in our in-person instruction. So I kind of kind of went around it there, but uh, it's, it's hard to do when we don't have in-person um, observational powers. Uh, so we have to have some sort of outcomes. Uh, I have students that are in, in both um, an on-campus, uh, so about a half the class will be on an on-campus class and about half the class will be uh, on a distance delivered of the class. It's College of Education course. And, and it's interesting to hear them talk about the difference. And they're both learning the same things. Uh, but like uh, the all of the discussion that happens in person, uh, those students in the online section are now doing in the discussion board. So they're trying to make sure and create that, that type of engagement. Uh, and that, by the way, can be both types of engagement with one another, but also in the material, because we're thinking about, uh, we're trying to think about the material, ask questions about the material, create things, whatever it may be. So that, that is their attempt to create the same level of engagement, both in person and uh, online. And so there are, there are some techniques there are folks who are, I do teach an online class. There are folks who, te who do a far better job at creating those. But one of the things I've realized is that uh, a module for my students has to just uh, keep switching kind of modalities or kind of uh, uh, techniques. And that helps create engagement as well. Anything else? I guess I'm, I'm a typical teacher. I finished in 50 minutes. Well, I appreciate everybody's uh, attendance. I appreciate your input and your uh, activities with me. I tried to create a little bit of engagement in there. Uh, and so I appreciate you, I guess, playing along with me today. So thanks. Yeah, Jonathan, that was that was fantastic. I really appreciated your insights. I thought it was very good demonstration of some of the engagement that you're inspiring us to do in our own classes. So I really appreciate that. So everyone who has not already, please join me in thanking Dr. Homer <laughs> for a wonderful session today. Uh, we have a post-event survey that we'll put into the chat for you to kind of uh, fill out at your convenience. We will archive this on our TLC webpage. So if you have other colleagues who need to see this, and they probably should, um, you can go check it out there. I remind you that next week we have a teaching chat um, where you can bring any issues or concerns or questions that you have for the group to kind of crowdsource. Um, other than that, thank you all so much, and I hope you have a great rest of your teaching day and week. And thank you again, Dr. Ulmer. Thank you, everybody.